Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit livetalksla.org. And now, here's the show you've tuned in to see. I've spent my career as a, as a, as a tech reporter um, covering these companies, Apple and Google and Microsoft and Facebook. And, you know, starting around the, the 2016 election, we knew that there was some, something wrong at, at, at Facebook and uh, many of the other companies. We had a feeling after Cambridge Analytica and some of the scandals that emerged after uh, that period uh, that there was misinformation and there was toxicity, but we didn't know the details. We didn't know the specifics. These companies are very, very good at maintaining a wall of secrecy, mm -hmm. of keeping the press out, of keeping the narrative tightly controlled. Um, so what Francis did, uh, allow me to say thank you as a journalist for you know, having the, the courage to come forward and to share these documents. It almost never happens. Um, yeah, it, if that was applause, then yeah, it's deserved. <laughs> um, it's, it, was, it was a real act of bravery, and we're gonna get into, you know, what led up to that, because you've written mm -hmm. this, this great book that's not just about the, the whistleblowing event mm -hmm. and the culture at these companies, but, of, uh, but about, you know, your personal history. Um, and what sort of set the stage to, to enable you to do that, because it, it, these companies are huge. There are thousands of people that work at these companies, and there are thousands of things going wrong at these companies, uh, not necessarily because they're evil people or mm -hmm. they're uh, you know, setting out to sort of conquer the world in a particularly nasty way, but all these little incentives to, to chase the profit margin. They start making compromised decisions, and we don't hear about them. Um, so it really does take uh, a special person uh, with, with a particular brand of courage to be able to surmount these obstacles, and this is what we're going to get into. So, Francis, with that elaborate introduction aside, let's, uh, let's go, go to the beginning, um, because your mm. book opens in uh, Iowa City, which was where I was born, too. Oh, really? I was, oh, I yeah. Oh, that. Um, How long did you have stayed in like, Iowa? I was there for only uh, for about four or five years, okay. uh, and then we moved. Can, can I ask what, what year you were born? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, 1983. 83, I was born in 84, hey. so we were probably... We were within a stone's throw. Did, did you go to like uh, Montessori, or did you, do you know where you went for preschool? You know, I don't know that I, 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 that I actually yeah. made it even to a preschool. Oh, okay, I'm just curious. Yeah, we could, I mean, we could have been in a classroom, look fun. at that. Yeah. Meeting together. The, one of the yeah. great ironies and I, uh, is uh, when I was at, at Facebook, the person who was in charge of, of feed rankings, this is like, how do you pick out what you see in your news feed and like in what order? The, the engineering vice president for it, like we were bo both born in Iowa City and we had, <laughs> this, right. and we had yeah. the same birthday yeah. and like went to the same elementary oh. school. Right? Like wow. our moms were in Lamaze class together. So it's like this weird kind of karmic thing. Yeah, I know. Even as a you yeah. know, highly technical person and an observer, of, it, sometimes the universe it's like, bends yeah. itself. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so there's a few things mm -hmm. that, uh, that stood out um, in, in the book. Uh, you know, you had a, a kind of a unique um, childhood, especially mm -hmm. up into high school. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, seems like from an early age you were very motivated and very sort of ambitious and were um, sort of a high achieving uh, student early on. Um, well, I think, I, uh, so I grew up in a university town. So my, I, I, I sometimes feel like a little apprehensive about getting like too much like Midwestern credit. Like sometimes people are always like, oh, like, you know, she's so wholesome, like from the Midwest. 
Um, because like my mother's from New York City and my father's from Berkeley. And like, you know, it's my, my mother always jokes that I'm regression to the mean. Um, and uh, the, um, I would say is, is, is kind of challenging if you're a kid in that, you know, uh, back when I was there, they didn't yet do a lot of busing between the elementary schools. So the, you know, the, the elementary school I went to, a huge fraction of all the parents either were professors or were graduate students. Mm -hmm. Um, or like there's another uh, elementary school where like a lot of the doctors for the university all sent their kids. And, and so it created really weird uh, like, um, expectations because you know, a huge fraction of your parents' friends have like Ivy League degrees. Right. And uh, um, you, know, you look around Iowa and you can see that you know, the deindustrialization is happening. In a place like Iowa City, there is such a huge tension between how many people want to live there and what it can actually support. So like every year, a whole bunch of college students all graduate and don't want to leave. Yeah. So it, it becomes this thing where you're like, oh, I have to get into a good school or I will, like, I, I may not even get to be a taxi driver, right? right? It's like that level of pressure. So you have like, the pressures <laughs> that early on. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so uh, and I, 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 I joined um, the debate team. Yeah. And like, I think that's one of those things where it, it you know, I didn't even really do it strategically. Like a, a close friend of mine was like, you know, you should try a debate. And I ended up uh, really finding a home there because um, it was like a stable place where I could spend a lot of time. And, uh, and yeah, it, and it's just one of these ironic things because it meant that it set me up to be able to exactly. you know, communicate later. Because that was a, a lot of the criticism that was like, oh. Oh, know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, you're too well put. To, this is too polished. She's a plant. She's a crisis actor. Yeah, she's a yeah. crisis actor. Uh, but no, I mean, and it yeah. is because you not only have, yeah. did you study engineering, you know, but you have a background in, in debate as well. And, and to give context, like my debate coach was so good. He literally became the head of like the National High School Debate Association. Like, like I, I and the great irony was like in, on my debate team, I was like the, the, the C debater, like um, in that like we had a, a person from a school that traveled with us because they were the only one from their school that did debate. And we had a debater from my school where she had the, 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 you know, the most bids, so like you have to do a certain level good at a certain number of prestigious debate tournaments to qualify for the national tournament. Um, you know, she had the most bids in the country and he had the second most in the country. And, and I was like, oh, I'm not very good. Like I'm you know, not number one or two in the country. You know, it's like these, these, these um, tragedies where we compare ourselves to other people. Yeah, yeah and speaking of tragedies, I, I do think it's worth, hmm noting for a second that you did experience a tragedy very early on mm. and with one of your best friends who got you into debate mm -hmm. uh, passed my co away. My co-captain. Your co-captain yeah. passed away in a car crash, uh, tragically. Um, how would you describe that as a mm. formative uh, So I, I think there's, uh, you know, I, I, I look back, so I'm, I'm a data scientist, so I look at a lot of things like quantitatively and, and you know, I, I can see in retrospect that I had like a, a a little bit of an outlier childhood in that like, like I didn't have like a friend died. I had like multiple friends die over my childhood. Like I, you know, I had um, like on my debate team alone, you know, the, there was a girlfriend hanger on that was always around us and she died of an eating disorder wow. my freshman year. Um, and then Tina came and got hit by, got, she got hit by a semi truck. Yeah. And it, it's one of these things where, um, and an another friend from high school like died you know, when I was in junior high. And, and I think it's one of these things where most people don't think about how precious their lives are, especially early, yeah. right? Like, like later on you say, oh, I had so little time. But like I always felt like our lives are incredibly short. And like uh, because I got so sick, I had that really reinforced yeah. that, you know, we, every, every moment is incredibly, incredibly precious. Yeah, and we're going to see, I think, how that sort of empathy mm -hmm. that you can then extend to people who are living, you know, thousands of miles away um, who might be experiencing harms um, that are perpetrated by a company that will <laughs> for now go unnamed. Yeah. Uh, and so you, you graduate and you go to this really interesting mm -hmm. sounding, uh, I hadn't heard of that program before, the Olin mm -hmm. um, sort of engineering school. Um, and I want to talk about that for one minute because it's going to also be a mm. theme that I think um, that we will return to. 
um, in that they really made an effort to sort of do something that a lot of mm. engineering schools don't, and that's integrate sort of humanities mm. and mm -hmm. more robust learning with engineering. A lot of times, somebody decides to go into engineering, you're just gonna build the system mechanically, mm. you're mm -hmm. not gonna think about, and then I think we see now, 10 years after sort of the dominance of companies like Facebook and all that, sort of what not thinking about the mm. humanities uh, gets us. So can you talk a little bit about sure. that chapter in your life? Um, so I, I, I went to a, a lab school and the, you know, it, it was formed with the intention of developing curriculum around teaching engineering in new ways. And it came out of a report that the National Science Foundation wrote in uh, like 1990. Mm. So they said, hey, like, we're about to see a really interesting transition in our economy. You know, like we, we've, been, we've been gearing up all these engineering programs for 50 years to give us engineers who can fight the Cold War. You know, they're, they're gonna grow up and become, you know, <laughs> widget makers in huge military industrial complex mm. companies. And we basically train them to like, you sit at this desk and do what you're told. Mm. And guess what, that's gonna change. Yeah. Like that's not, that's not the future of the economy. We need people who can go out and be entrepreneurs, who can, uh, you know, talk to people and assess their needs and say, oh, you have a problem and, you know, I could build a thing that could actually solve that and then take that to market. And in order to do that kind of whole arc, you know, you have to cultivate students who, who, who are able to connect to people, who are able to be empathetic, who, who can, you know, cooperate and collaborate in order to, um, you know, do that whole journey. And um, 10 years passed, so now it's 2000, and they looked around and nothing had changed, right? And they were like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> like, we told you 10 years ago, this is, not gonna, this is not a good strategy, and yet none of you have changed. Um, and, uh, and so they, they started looking around for like, if they were going to do something that was more, um, the Olin Foundation uh, I was founded um, off of uh, basically blood money. So like money for munitions, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, they had, the intention of the foundation was to do these trans, trans, transformational gifts to schools. And so there's on the order of like 75 Olin buildings around uh, the United States. And around the same time, the Olin Foundation was realizing they were starting to give second buildings to campuses. And they were like, if this was supposed to be transformational, like why are we giving you a second building? Like, like you know. Um, and so they decided to do a terminal gift and found the college. And so it was the first uh, new engineering program in quite a while. Um, and it, it, was, it was quite interesting because um, I, I, I had never really thought about what the consequences would be of like not having upperclassmen. And so um, one of the things that makes me quite concerned about the experience of like high schoolers today is we're, I, I, we take for granted how much upperclassmen socialize younger students. Right. And like I got to live that experience at least at the college level where we were four year seniors, right. you know? We never got coached in those ways. Right. And, and one of the things that younger people are facing today is we closed the schools for two years and the juniors and seniors who should have socialized the freshmen and sophomores didn't really get to do that job. And, and now those same kids, the freshmen and sophomores, are the juniors and seniors. And we've kind of cut that socialization escalator um, in a way that we really do need to be engaging with. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. It's also kind of interesting. There's a component there where a lot of these people who get, like the kids who get exposed to social media for the first time, it's like almost like this onslaught of mm -hmm. sort of, you know, it's a kind of a difficult thing to navigate. Um, but so after you you go through this unique program, mm -hmm. um, you I know I, I know. Uh, from reading the book, what, what happens next? But what was what was drawing mm. you to to Silicon Valley at that point? I know oh, you want to get out of Iowa. Yeah. Why? Uh... So so post college. Um, so like my my original plan had always been like if I didn't get into if I didn't get a job or excuse me if I didn't get into grad school, you know I was going to just go back and live with my parents and I'd do a startup or something. I yeah. try to and you know worse than I get a job, and on uh, the I I got I I had applied to Harvard, uh, Harvard's business school, um, I, as part of like an experimental program. So they, they, they held an open house when I was a junior, or maybe a sophomore. Sophomore or junior, not sure, somewhere in that range. Um, and they were basically like, hey, like, I, you know, it used to be people went straight from college to get their MBA. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like law school. Yeah. You know, you'd go straight in, 
maybe half of students, 80% of students would go straight in from, from undergrad. Um, and over time, the average number of years of, of work experience kept creeping up higher and higher because students would look at that number and say, oh, I shouldn't apply until I have that number of years. Um, and they were realizing like that wasn't sustainable over time. Yeah. They needed to figure out how to bring that number back down. And they were losing out on high quality students who would right. go to law school because they liked the risk management perspective. And so um, I applied to, they were like, hey, you should, you should try applying as an, uh, an undergraduate and go right after college. And given I had at this point an unaccredited engineering degree, I was like, oh, this sounds like a great idea. And so I, I get back my admissions decision and you know, I had a plan for if I got in, I was gonna go. If I had a plan if I didn't get in, I was gonna like go home and live with my parents and do a startup. I didn't have a plan for what I didn't even realize was an option, which was they could defer me. And so I get this letter and it says, hey, you know, you're gonna have to wait two years. Like then you can go. Like we're gonna save a spot for you, but you need to go, go out in the world. Um, oh, and by the way, you need to get a job. And I, I call them up and I'm like, hey, like I don't have a job. Like, <laughs> Like, I have an unaccredited engineering degree. Like, I was going to go do a startup in my parents' garage. Um, and they were like, oh, we love entrepreneurship. Um, and a couple months later, I, like, called them up and I was like, hey, like, so how do I get this, like, you know, signed off? Like, as, like, a, what I'm doing. And there was, like, silence for a week. And they came back and they were like, actually, we talked about that. And we would like you to have a more structured work experience. And, and I, don't, I don't know if any of you have guided a, a younger person through getting a job in the last 10, 15 years, but like very few really interesting work experiences hire for starting before October 1st during the summer, right? Like usually those things hire, especially for people straight from college, they hire like, you know, 10, nine, 10 months out, um, particularly for engineering programs because um, a huge fraction of all those first jobs for technical people are at very, very large companies that kind of have cattle call kind of situations. And um, so I start frantically applying for jobs and uh, no one is interested. Like no one is interested. And now I'm like actually quite concerned because like my plan had always been like, oh, I, you know, I can go do a startup because like worst comes to worst, you know, then I'll go get a job. And now I'm realizing no one wants to hire me. <laughs> um, and what ended up really saving me was um, I applied to be a book scanning supervisor at Google, which is um, uh, basically you are like a supervisor in a, a, a book scanning factory. Um, and it is a, for the Google Books, for the Google Books project. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and it is a job that I am very grateful they did not give me um, because <laughs> it is. I, that the, being a, a book scanner is soul crushing because it's like you literally turn pages all day, every day for, you know, the, the average time people survive was like six weeks because it is, <laughs> even listening to podcasts, it's that dull. Um, and and it, it was one of those jobs where it said like engineering degree preferred but not required, which really means no one with an engineering degree would want this job. Um, <laughs> And, and I interviewed for it, and it was the only job where they went, you are overqualified for this job. <laughs> Actually. They were like, we don't think you're gonna fit, you're overqualified for this. And I was like, well, I really wanted to apply for this other job at Google. Like, I applied for it, you know, could you pass my resume along? And they were like, or like, could you, if I wrote like a description of a one, would you pass along? And they were like, yeah, of course we will. Um, which I learned later, they never did. <laughs> um, but uh, I happened to talk to one of my friends and um, he was like, oh, you should get this professor at Olin to recommend you, because she knows one of the early engineers there. And uh, it turned out that's the actual reason I got interviewed, was at Google, if, if you had one person vouch for you, they would at least give you a phone screen. And, um, and so I had never intended to come to California. So like my, my father is an ex-Californian, and the only people more passionate than, say, ex-Catholics or ex-smokers are ex-Californians. <laughs> um, and and I, I had very strong feelings about what was California. I was like, oh, this is going to be horrible, you know, blah, 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 because I've been listening to my father talk about this for 20 years, right? And I show, and the I, hippies and the hedonism. Oh, and that kind no, of, yeah. no, 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 oh. just like, oh, it's too expensive and everyone's miserable and blah, 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 blah. Like, oh. you know, there's, there's a mythos of people who live, right? And, and um, uh, 
and, and so I get this job, and I'm like, oh no, now I have to move to California. And I show up, and I'm like, <laughs> what was he talking about? <laughs> this is great. Um, and, uh, and I ended up staying for you know, 15 years till COVID, yeah. and then I moved to Puerto Rico. So. Yeah, and you were then, and you started work at Google. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, so before we dive into, into Facebook, um, I thought there was a really interesting episode you describe at, at, at the project you were working at. Is book related at, at Google, because mm -hmm. um, then you went on to work at a couple other Silicon Valley companies. Um, but yeah, the, the, this project uh, mm. where, you're, where you're trying to develop a sort of, you know, the searchable reference or, or in, inside Google like, Books. Like, yeah. um, Can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, one of the things that probably most people in this room probably take for granted is, is the, the skills you need to actually, you know, extract information from a book are, are quite complicated. You know, like, like being able to say like, oh, I know to go to the back and like look in the table of contents and then I'm gonna do this and that and that's how I'm gonna get to my answer. Like those are very nuanced skills. Um, and uh, most people are not gonna be able to do information discovery from a book. Um, it's like a startlingly high fraction of people. It's like 50% or more if you said, I, the answer to your question is in this book, can you find it? Mm. They will not be able to do that. And, um, and so I, I was doing an internship uh, at Google while I was in business school. So I'd been doing product management. I wanted to get better at coding because I'm um, an electrical engineer by training, not a computer scientist. And um, I was building out this demo of like, hey, this is how you could manipulate the information we have in books to make it more discoverable for people. And um, I was able to build like a really interesting interface that like helped summarize books and help you discover like what questions you might want to ask from a book. And we came right up to like the, the kind of gatekeepers that keep you like right before you launch something. And I- the lawyers. I, the lawyers are one of the many, many hurdles you step over, right? Um, and I, I ran to this thing called um, moral rights. So in, in Europe, uh, they have this concept that like, let's say you were an architect and 200 years ago you built a bridge and you designed this bridge over this river and the city now wants to put lights on your bridge. You know, they're gonna like ac accentuate things or whatever. Um, your descendants could come out and say, no, 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 that is against the spirit of the work. Like that would violate the spirit of the work. We are going to exert our moral rights. And the fear was that if we basically were remixing these books, because we're like helping summarize them, uh, that that could be constitute a violation of moral rights. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I, I try to bring up in there is that, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who blindly believes regulation is good partially because I have experienced like regulation can come with costs. You know, like you cannot use that interface I built today, even though it was really, it was really, um, it felt like a, like a portal into a book. Like it was, it, I had a number of really magical experiences with it. Um, be, because like, you know, uh, there is a framework there that, that um, stood in the way. So it was just, that's part of why I included that. And it was, it's also kind of a, it also kind of harkens, because this is back Mm -hmm. Like 12 years, like in the late aughts, would have 20, been? Yeah, 2010, 2011, 2010. somewhere there. Yeah. So, which was kind of like just. Yeah, Arab Spring. Right? Yeah. yeah that and time. almost a kind of a gentler era of tech or something mm -hmm. where they, it wasn't, we weren't quite moving as fast or breaking as many things mm -hmm. quite yet. Um, but so you have, you, you go to Google, you, mm -hmm. you do go back to, to Harvard. I, this is, I'm going to fast forward over some details here. It's, it's in the book. There's a lot of. Mm -hmm. um, great personal biography and memoir um, and but in the interest of time we so after you spend some time at mm -hmm. Yelp and you spend some time at Pinterest uh, so just for context the, the way I went from being at Google to being at Yelp was I I, um, I got incredibly sick and like had to relearn to walk and because mm -hmm. even I didn't know why I was getting sick um, uh, my, my manager thought I was faking Right, because I couldn't, I couldn't defend why it was I was like progressively. To get out of work, he thought you were faking. Yeah, he to... thought I was just, you know, providing excuses. Yeah. Um, I, and so I, I ended up losing my job at Google. And when I came back um, into the workforce, I went to Yelp. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that must have been such a frustrating uh, experience. Um, yeah. 
So, we, so, so then at this period, so can you tell us how you, how you arrive at Facebook? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And I know you were conflicted about mm -hmm. whether or not to take the plunge at Facebook mm -hmm. again. This is kind of after the election cycle. Mm -hmm. Facebook has some... After Cambridge Analytica. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, you know, the process of relearning to walk is like really hard. You know, it took me... I, uh, you know, full 15 months where I was kind of out of the workforce just because I was just flat out too weak to be able to, to do anything. And even when I came back to work, I, I really was only at the level of strength where I could like go to work, come home, and then collapse on the couch, right? Like I didn't really have like a lot of spare capacity in my life. And um, when I started wanting to like uh, try to get my life a little bit more together, um, I decided I, I, if I was going to make progress doing things like going through a storage unit, like really like unpacking boxes, cleaning up things, whatever, um, I was going to need help because like I could either haul my boxes or I could go through them. I was not going to be able to do both. Um, and uh, so I hire uh, a friend of my younger brothers. You know, they had, they had lived together in like a, a hacker house. So okay. think, think like a warehouse with like 16 bunk beds and a kitchen and a bathroom, right? Like a kind of classic San Francisco institution. And um, I, so I, I meet this young man, he's, he's college educated, he's smart, he's funny, he's lived abroad, he's like, you know, he's really interesting, like he's, he's very scrappy. Um, I, I initially hired him to do things like please carry the box from the storage unit so I, and like haul the trash away after I've sorted through things. Right. Um, but he ended up becoming like, a really important friend and ally because he was a little lost, I was a little lost, like he didn't really know how to like launch out into the world. Like I, I was I was more than happy to like hang out with him and answer questions if he was willing to like hang out and, with me and walk very slowly. <laughs> right. And um I he, I really view him as someone who was instrumental to me giving me back my life. And in twenty sixteen um, I watched him really get sucked down the rabbit hole um, on the internet. Um, so he, uh, he was a Bernie Sanders supporter, and in the wake of Bernie losing the primary, uh, he turned to some of the, the harder places on the internet to commiserate with people and, and find um, you know, places where he could, he could uh, address like, his feelings of grievance that you know, Bernie had been sabotaged. Did that process start at Facebook? Like, do you think? You know, that I don't. I think it was probably more like for an HN and yeah. Reddit. Yeah. Um, but it meant that because I was like watching this process unfold with him, yeah. and I was working at Pinterest on ranking, like on the algorithms that you know, how do we pick out what to show you? What order should we show it to you? Pinterest um, being, a, it's a kind of an image-based. It's, it's, it was quite popular for a while, mm -hmm. but it was a, a, a board of different images. You could arrange them kind of like blog mm -hmm. style, right? It was like a differently formatted sort of Instagram, mm -hmm. right? I guess that's a fair way. It, it's, uh, it's, it's meant to be a discovery engine. Right. So like if you, um, like I'm in the process of like renovating a house right now and uh, to communicate with our architect, like what we want the stairs to look like. Yeah. You know, I have a board that's images that are like, or like uh, you can have different themes, that kind of thing. Clothing was really popular. Yeah, clothing, yeah. food, clothing, yeah. interior design. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm sitting and going to meetings every day talking about biases in the algorithms. So in our case, our, our bias was towards older images. It's like older images had more information about like who liked them, what was the topicality of this thing. Um, I, but it, it meant that when I interacted with Facebook, you know, I'm, I'm watching my friends struggle with like information quality issues. I'm watching, I'm like interacting with the product and I'm, I'm looking at it in a very different way than I'd ever looked at it before. Because like when I would see different parts of it, I'd say, oh, I, I can see trends in, in what they're likely biasing towards. Um, and after the election happened, like it came out that there had been some really kind of egregious asleep at the wheel moments. So like most people think like Russian misinformation. Um, I would say probably uh, almost certainly a much, much larger factor than Russian misinformation was like Macedonian misinformation. 
So like in a classic kind of cliche of like the difference between state effectiveness and like entrepreneurial effectiveness. Um, you had like a, probably under 10,000 people in Macedonia who uh, stood up fake news sites because they could drive traffic to these blogs that looked like, you know, you know, niche newspapers um, and get advertising revenue. And they distributed billions and billions and billions of impressions just to Americans. Um, and because Facebook wasn't thinking about would people want to economically, economically exploit our platform? Um, and this is, you know, th these are stories like uh, Pope endorses Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. You know, really, really low hanging things. Just made um, up and just and totally clickbait. made up. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, you they, might remember some of them around. Yeah. Again, it was like that. There was that peak, and I mean, it was part of it was that you know Facebook didn't consider how much that it could be abused, but it mm -hmm. also maybe didn't mind so much that yeah. there's this big surge of activity. Because, you know, more content means more. you spend more time on it and you click on more ads, yeah. you know? Um, but in the wake of the election, um, a lot of people said, hey, you can't play so fast and loose. Yeah. And Facebook responded. Like, they, they formed a group called Civic Integrity, which was the team that I worked on at Facebook. Yeah. So, how did you get it? How did you get involved? How did you wind up at Facebook? So, did you? Was, so they reached out to you. So, uh, a recruiter reached out and said, "Hey, do I work at Facebook?" And um, you know, this is a thing that Facebook. You, if you're above maybe five years of seniority in the industry, Facebook will reach out to you multiple times a year, and that's just because they know they struggle to get talent that isn't straight from college um, because of brand issues. Um, uh, and uh, they know that if they catch you in just the right moment, like you might be more, more, more open-minded, right? Like maybe there was a, uh, something happened in your life where you're like, oh, now, I, now I'm willing to accept the liability of Facebook because it will pay more or like, you know, whatever the circumstances are. Um, and so they, this email arrives for me and I very clearly did not care if I got this job. And so I wrote back a kind of flippant email where I was like, you know, the only thing I would do at Facebook is work on misinformation. And I, I thought that would just like, you know, make them go away. And they came back and they're like, actually, no, we have a job uh, around civic misinformation. Um, you know, are you interested in it? And um, I sat on that for a long time. So I, I applied for it. Or like I slow walked interviewing for it. I slow walked accepting it. Because you were conflicted about. Yeah, super yeah. conflicted. Yeah. Because on, on one side, like, I, I, I felt like um, I still felt that pain of losing my friend. Like, like he, he uh, I watched him uh, kind of disengage from our consensus reality over a number of months. And it was just, it was just excruciatingly painful to feel like I couldn't, I couldn't bring him back. Yeah. Um, and so on one side, I felt like, uh, I knew that there was a relatively small set of people who had the set of experiences I'd had because like the, the specialty that I had around algorithms and like algorithmic products, it, it's just, it's not very common. Like you can't take a college class on it. You have to get kind of trained up in the industry. Um, uh, there's not a lot of places you can even work on it in the industry. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I, I knew that you know if I could help one person not feel the pain that I had felt, like it would be worth it. Right, like you felt you were in kind of in a unique yeah. position to maybe be able to help fix things inside. And but at the same time, you know, it's Facebook. Yeah. You know, like how how like you know how delusional are you to think that you actually could could, could change. change Facebook? You know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I know a lot of people who have have tried then. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> so. You, so when you get, so you do, you show up to Facebook um, and it's pretty clear immediately that it's a different kind of company. Mm -hmm. There's a two week orientation and then mm -hmm. you're even pulled out of that mm -hmm. to, uh, you're kind of thrown right into the fire. So mm -hmm. what is it, what are the first impressions of Facebook? What's going on in this sort of post-election, post-Macedonian content mill, post-Russian mm -hmm. misinformation Facebook? So like very early red flags are things like I came in and I thought my job was to work on like United States misinformation and like the lead up to the election. I show up and I'm informed, oh no, 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 you're going to work on misinformation anywhere in the world where there isn't third party fact checking. 
So like Facebook pays journalists to go and research like little articles that go and get um, appended to like extremely popular like misinformation. And um, the uh, misinformation, oh, um, but that program only covers a very small slice of users. You know, it, it's largely in the United States and Western Europe, um, a little bit in India. Um, but there are, you know, billions of Facebook users who live in African countries in Southeast Asia where there are no, there, there are no journalists that are hired by Facebook for this role. Um, and so I, you know, from the, from the get go, it was just like red flag after red flag. So things like, I had never really thought about the idea that Facebook was the internet for some of the most uh, fragile places in the world. Yeah, the free the, basics program. Yeah, right? free basics. Yeah. So Facebook said, hey, we rose to prominence because we killed Friendster. We killed MySpace. You know, these were the you know, exciting social networks of the early 2000s. Um, this is a room where people might actually remember such things. Like when, when, I, when I talk to college students, I'm like, you know, the internet did exist in 2004. You know? Eyes glaze <laughs> you know? over. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, they're like, oh, MySpace. I heard that, you know, that was a hipster thing back in the day. Um, but uh, the. Um, but I, so in like the third, yeah, in in, com in, in So, Africa, so they, yeah. they said, like, you know, we came to power because we surprised them, yeah. you know. I, we don't want a surprise to come from somewhere we're not paying attention. Right. And, and, you know, when I, I worked on Google Plus in 2011, 2012, there were still countries in the world where the dominant form of social media was not Facebook. Um, you know, South Korea, um, I, 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 Brazil, India, like there were places in the world where Facebook was not the dominant thing. And I, Facebook said, hey, if we go into those places and say, the cost of data right now is extremely expensive. If you use our products, your data will be free. If you use anything else, you're gonna have to pay for it yourself. Uh, that was enough of a market force because remember, you know, data was sixty-five, a hundred dollars a gigabyte in places where the monthly wage might be three hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, and so enough of the population in, in each of those countries could only use free basics that you had a situation where um, if you pull people even today, even though data is way cheaper now, and you say, hey, do you use the internet? Do you use Facebook? There's a 10% margin more people who say, I use Facebook and say, I use the internet, because they don't even know that they're using the internet. Right, they don't know that it's, it's, the internet right. is Facebook. Yeah. To, to billions, uh, hundreds of millions of people, uh, which is just, I mean, it's something that we don't, I mean, we, it's, it's, uh, it's an international story mm -hmm. and it's something that we, Kind of forget that it was a very savvy move mm -hmm. for to to corner those markets and and it worked and it's still true and it's still true and so I show up and I had I had kind of vaguely heard about free basics I kind of it, the, the the generic category of programs like that is known as zero rating so uh, it often um, zero rating happens for other verticals like you might have a country where you say Spotify is your data is free for Spotify. Um, but uh, the, I, I was totally unaware that it had like choked out the free internet, like the open internet in these places. And, and you now set up a really, really dangerous circumstance because you have these places where people don't have alternatives, where 80 or 90% of all the content available on the internet in many languages in the world only exists on Facebook. Yeah. So you have people who can't really step away to an alternative and they only lose money for Facebook. Right. And Facebook has chosen a safety strategy of kind of censoring after the fact. So they do content moderation after the fact instead of designing for safety up front. So now you have a situation where it's like these people lose money for Facebook, they're in the most fragile circumstances, but there's not really a way to scale the safety systems to cover their languages in a cost-effective way. Right, because these are like quote unquote low value users. They're yeah. not bringing in as much advertising revenue or they're not as valuable to advertisers. Um, if you're a social media user in say Myanmar mm -hmm. um, or India. So 
So you see all of these, mm -hmm. uh, th 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 these revelations kind of begin to, begin to come almost mm -hmm. immediately. Um, it and, and, it's, and to give you a sense of kind of the magnitude, um, you know, like at Facebook, uh, you, you only make progress if you can measure it. And um, by definition, nothing is misinformation unless a third party fact checker says it's misinformation. And within we're, the company. Within right. the company, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and we're working only on misinformation where there are no third party fact trackers. Um, so we had to figure out, you know, we're having these discussions the first couple of days I'm there around like, what should be our measure of success then? And, and someone was saying, you know, what if we did like expressions of doubt? So like if I, if I write on a post, I think that's false. Or I think that's misinformation. Um, right, your uncle posts yeah. a news story. It says the you know the Pope endorses Donald Trump, yeah. and you're like, this is outrageous. No way. Then you would count that, right? That would be an expression yeah. of doubt. Yeah. So uh, the um, one of our researchers was like, you know, that I, I totally get that. That sounds super reasonable, but but the re reality is like I I was in India a few months ago prepping for the um, Indian national elections, like the parliamentary elections. And I sat in interviews with people with master's degrees who, because they are so new to the internet, like they just came online, they'll say things like, why would someone put something false on the internet? That sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. And again, that plugs into the free basics yeah. things where you're sort of, you're handed a phone, it comes loaded with mm -hmm. Facebook, and it's like, oh, I can do the internet now. Why would I distrust this? Thing, this and if it comes from your, yeah. your your uncle or it comes right. from a family member, your own community. You know, you're yeah. saying, well, why would why would my why would this person I trust tell me something that's false? Right. Right. Like, why would they pass on something that wasn't true? Yeah, and we've had years and years, or if not decades, of you know Snopes and debunking and people's and sort of we have some information literacy. Well, people trolling. Yeah, and right? trolling. We yeah. got used to it, but. Uh, you know, five years ago, and even some places now, that's just not the case. Right? I always like to joke that um, I, 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 trolls and shit posters are actually like a cultural asset. Right. Like right. The, that that we sit there and we, they we inoculate see, us. yeah they inoculate us yeah. right. You know. So when do you begin to realize that beyond the, this? So this is this is the conditions are ripe for mm. for problems. When do you begin to realize that there's more than that? Like there are actual. Um, ethical violations, mm. people being untruthful mm. uh, out about what Facebook is actually doing. When does mm. all that start to? Um, well, I think, I think like some of the like very early on moments where I was like, there, there, there are governance issues and organizational health issues that are um, really serious. Like, like uh, you, you can't have a system with like this much power that is this chaotic was, um, so in the spring of 2019, um, uh, President Modi in India started um, posting some, some quite hateful and like dehumanizing things on Facebook about Muslims. So he's the, the leader of the country, he's talking about Muslims um, in terms of the mean insects or, or, or um, rodents. And there's a very long history of you know, when the, the road to ethnic violence has like a lot of incremental steps and, and leaders using really dehumanizing language is like a kind of a precursor to escalating hate. And, and people uh, flag this, and, but be, you know, he's a world leader. And so there's, there was a concern that um, if they took down Modi's content for using this kind of dehumanizing language, what would happen if Trump started talking about, you know, Mexican Americans in the same language, right? Or immigrants in the same language? Yeah. Would they have to take Trump's stuff down? And so they kicked off uh, a working group of maybe 30 or 40 people, you know, a bunch of them with PhDs in things like atrocity studies, um, but also touching kind of every part of the company that would be impacted by a policy like that, you know, the ads team, the uh, public relations team, the governmental relations team, you know, all these different stakeholders. And over the course of maybe four months, they write a robust policy that weighs lots of different trade-offs, has like very precise criteria that says like, this is when Facebook will step in. Mm. You know, it has to be this level of- This is the red line. Yeah, it's like, 
the country has to be this level unstable, this is how bad the red line has to be, this has to be the recurrent behavior, I mean, the whole thing. And um, they go and present it to Mark Zuckerberg, and he announces that this is completely inadequate, and he knows better, and he's gonna write it over the weekend. And he, <laughs> <laughs> and he comes back on, on you know, uh, Monday or Tuesday, and they just straight up announce it to the public. Like, it's not like he writes a draft and like kicks off another cycle of this process. No, he just comes out and he publishes it, and it's very simple. It says, you know, we will not take down any speech from, from politicians. Yeah. The only problem is like- Was that uh, a red line for you? Was well, that well the, the red line for me was, was um, the, the chaos that it created, yeah. right? So it's not so much that, you know, I objected that he was being a free speech absolutist. It was things like, what does it mean to be a politician? Like if you are an elected dog catcher, and in a lot of cities, dog catcher actually is a little elected position, probably is in Los Angeles. Um, does that mean your speech is protected? Um, Facebook doesn't have databases of all the elected politicians. Like the policy was unenforceable or, or the, um, the ads team wasn't even consulted. Yeah. Like it, it was a level of like um, chaos where you had people coming out, like we had fact checkers that quit because they got punished because they accidentally fact-checked politicians <laughs> um, and, and because, it was, because they were so low level, right? right? Um, and so uh, watching, uh, like, he was just completely unaccountable. Yeah. Like, we're in a situation where there's people in really vulnerable circumstances. You have someone who has unilateral power and they don't, yeah. they don't listen to, they don't recognize conscientiousness. Right. And we already knew yeah. that uh, and terrible atrocities had happened in yep. Myanmar in particular. The UN had came out and said, yep. Facebook totally. really played a role in, uh, in allowing the government to yep. b basically scapegoat a, a min uh, a, a, an ethnic minority and people were killed, you know? Tens of thousands of people yeah. were killed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so and, you and saw that. And, and to be clear, like that report, like, you know, uh, that was in the scope of what my job was supposed to be, right? right? That, that the, um, the Myanmar government sent officers in their military to Russia in the early 2000s to learn how to run Russian style information operations, like domestic information operations. They came out, they activated people very directly and said like, there's a crisis, we have to kill them right now. Like you need to do it at, right right now. And, and people killed their neighbors, right? Because they, again, they're lie. There yeah. are these lies, there's false posts that they had dummy accounts mm -hmm. and they put really, really, again, that kind of, that, that story didn't um, necessarily get the attention. I, 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 I mean, it, it, it may got attention, but to, it's a truly powerful example of what social media can do, mm -hmm. the danger of social media. And, and for context, like inside of Facebook, uh, only one person in the customer support organization spoke Burmese. He's in Ireland, right? I'm sitting in Dublin, yeah. sitting in Ireland, and he was like actively saying, everything's gone off the rails. And because the organization that he sat in is, is a factory, yeah. there was no routes for information to go upwards. For the alarm know, bell to the be heard, yeah. yeah. And the UN was even saying, we were yep. trying to get in touch with you guys, and nobody was listening or no one would, and then, mm -hmm. and then a, a ethnic cleansing happened and it's really, really crazy that that happened. And we're, we're getting short on time here, so I do wanna hear about, uh, before we take mm. some questions, I wanna hear about that process. So mm -hmm. you have all of this, you see that nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. what, how does the idea even come to you to begin to think about blowing the whistle? Mm. So I lived with my parents during COVID and I think that was a really transformational experience because um, it meant that as I saw things like fraying, um, I didn't have to suffer alone, right? Like a lot of whistleblowers, they are not in great shape by the time they blow the whistle because they've had to hold a secret, you know, in, in, in by themselves. Like Snowden never told anyone until he came out, you know. Uh, this is a recurrent pattern you see over and over again. And, um, but as I was watching it, I could go have dinner with my parents and be like, I saw this completely unreasonable thing today. And my, my father pointed out to me 
how ridiculous my circumstances were. He was like, so by that point, I was working on uh, counter espionage under our threat intelligence group. So like I'm literally watching like Iranian military people catfishing Israeli military people. Like it, it, it really is, you know, international relations kind of stuff. Um, and he was like, Francis, if you were the lowest level technician in my lab, so he runs a clinical lab for a hospital, you know, if you were the, you know, the, you had joined two weeks ago, you run blood tests, you know, lowest level person in my lab, there would be a sign in the elevator, there'd be a sign in the break room, there'd be a sign in your toilet stall that said, did you see something that endangered patient safety? Call this number, someone will listen to you and take you seriously. Mm -hmm. You have a Harvard MBA and you're working on national security issues and you don't know who to call. Like we've outsourced critical safety functions to a private company that has no, no oversight. And so by the time I reached the moment where they dissolved civic integrity in the wake of the 2020 election, I had already had normalized with my parents that I was not unreasonable, that, that I was seeing things that were really, really unacceptable. And, and when they dissolved civic integrity, it was kind of like the, the last, it, I, I could no longer imagine a case that could be made that Facebook had a chance of saving itself. Yeah. Because you know, they had dissolved their vanguard. You know, when, I, when I went to a Harvard Business School, I took a class called Change Management, which sounds like the, a cliche business school class. Um, and you're know, like, oh, you wanna be a consultant when you grow up. Um, and you know, change management though is, a, is an established academic field. Like think about how hard it is to change a single habit for one person. When you get a group of people together, now there's, there's inertia, you know, there's, there's uh, invested interests in the status quo. You have to do certain things if you want to have any chance of an organization changing. And one of them is you need to appoint a vanguard and say, this is the future, you know, we're going this way, You're, we're gonna follow them. And if you, if you either need to get behind them or you need to get out of the way. And, and that was civic integrity, yeah. all the way from the 2016 elections up through the 2020 election. But a month after the 2020 election, they, they basically said, uh, you're so important, we're gonna, we need to integrate you into other parts of the company. Mm. Right. And, and that was the moment where I was like, I, I'm going to have to figure out how to bring in other help. Yeah. You're gonna to have to come in from the outside, mm -hmm. you know. And so, what you know? What did you have? Did you look to Snowden as mm -hmm. a model, or what did you? So you you started because at this at this point, mm -hmm. a lot of people say, "I give up," and they quit, mm -hmm. or they you know, yeah. or they you know, make a ruckus inside and then get fired, or mm -hmm. they what you know, every other avenue. It's clear Facebook is not going to address this. Democratically inside the organization, it's it's clear nothing else. So how hmm. how hmm. did you you know what you have your support of your parents? Mm -hmm. That's big. That's huge. Uh, you know how did you how did you get hmm. from there to you know a congressional hearing? So so I I felt I felt in many ways like early on like when I was when I was learning all this like yeah. it, it felt like Facebook had stolen my future, oh. right? That that um, that I had I had been. They had opened the curtain and now I felt like I was culpable because I knew what, what was going on and uh, if, I, if I were to just go quit, um, the thing I feared was you know, five years or 10 years or 15 years going by and, and what I feared happening, which was you know, when I joined there was one genocide, by the time I left there were two, so Ethiopia had unfolded mm -hmm. at that point. You know, if you did see an extrapolation, you know, 10 or 20 million people really could die over 20 years. Like it was very clear that as more people came online, as you got richer and richer media, like you, not, you go from maybe photos to having video, like you could have a lot of people die. And um, I, I feared like, you know, if I, what would, it, what would my life be like if I had to lay in bed at night every night wondering like you had a chance to do something and you chose not to. Yeah. Um, and so I, 
and yeah. And it just, it yeah. was also a very involved process. I mean, you talk, in, the, mm -hmm. in the book, you doc, I mean, this isn't just like you say, okay, I'm blowing the whistle, it's all done. It's, you're copying documents, it's an arduous process. Was it difficult uh, and yeah. was it scary, like, to be? Uh, and it, was, it was extremely scary from the perspective of, like, I knew that we had one shot, right? That, that if I got caught and it was obvious that I had taken as much as I had, that they would close the doors and make sure no one ever got anything again, like at that scale, yeah. or, or anything that was sensitive, yeah. which, which did happen after I left. Like they closed down lots and lots of things, and they, they now have a, a concept that they call it narrative excellence, <laughs> because they're, they're very good at branding at Facebook. Like there's, there's no genocide, there's yeah. social cohesion breaking down. <laughs> um, you know, um, but- So Orwellian. Yeah, yeah. I, oh yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what happens when you have too many like Harvard marketing majors yeah. working for you. Um, yeah. But I, I this was twenty two thousand. Yeah. So, um, yeah it's like so, but um, so what? What I did was I took pictures of my computer screen because um, I didn't know what level of surveillance I was under. Right. right? So like, um, if you like, one thing that Snowden had an advantage on was that he actually ran an, a big part of the archiving system. Yeah. And so he had a greater sense of like what the vulnerabilities were. I, I had no idea what the level of corporate security was. And so I chose to be the most cautious I could be and, and never have my, processy, my processes intersect with my laptop itself. So I would take pictures of the screen of a document, but I would never say print out a document, that kind of thing. Yeah, and then you end up with this huge, you know, it occurs to me, like, it would have been nice to have your book technology to read all those <laughs> files that you, to search out. Yeah. Um, and I think we're, uh, we're, we're, we're getting over to our time here, uh, but there's just, I mean, there's so much, mm -hmm. there's so much in this book, and there's so much to talk about. Uh, I could keep, I, I could keep going and going, but uh, I'm sure folks have, have questions. So we run ads in promoting our events, mm -hmm. and, um, I was alarmed, and I continue to be alarmed, you know, I, we mm -hmm. run an ad, for example, for an event we had earlier this year on, by uh, Matthew Desmond, Poverty by mm. America. That's considered a social issue. Mm. So we have to get approved mm. by the gods at Facebook to run social issue related ads. Mm. And mm -hmm. in this case, it's a book about a social issue. So there's a long, prolonged process to be approved to do that, because we don't want to be tampering, mimicking, you know, putting out mm -hmm. bad stuff. It would take days to get approved for that. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I hear of the kind of ads that um, mm -hmm. the campaign manager who ran Trump ads would like had a back doorway mm -hmm. to drop hundreds of thousands of dollars of ads like approved mm -hmm. instantaneously. So what kind of a system takes place? Like, it seemed like there were like two doors. There mm, were like, you know, totally. you were c customer A, yeah. and then there's everybody else. I mean, who oversaw, oversaw that? I mean, it was... So that's, that's part of like the political speech policy. You know, because people, like if you're an elected official or you're like you're running for office, like the um, Facebook said, we don't, we don't want to be seen as um, like weighing in or like being biased, so we're just not gonna even consider it. And um, I, have, I have a whole bunch of questions for you afterwards on like, did you see anything anomalous when you promoted this event? Because there has been a pattern of, of uh, events that I speak at having odd things happen to their Facebook ads, so I would love to ask you later. Um, but, but, there, but there is a real thing of um, Facebook, uh, Facebook would love for um, it to be just for advertising, you know, dishwasher soap, right? Like if it was just like, you know, Tide and like uh, Cascade and, you know, things that are innocuous, that would be their fantasy because then they wouldn't have to wade into all these issues. But the reality is like the only way you can actually detect like is this innocuous or is not, this not innocuous is like having humans really go in there in a, in a close way vet them and they don't have the capacity to do those things. So you end up having these weird biases where things that should get screened out or be treated with at least that same level of rigor don't get that rigor, but issues that are, are in veins of you know, inequality or, or environmental issues getting taken down. 
Could you talk about how a, you think AI is going to, mm -hmm. could AI be the cop that is not human, who's just awake all the time reading mm. all this stuff and then make pronouncements based on some models? So one of the, so in order to have systems that say, this is okay, this is not okay, you have to have something called a classifier. So it basically says, is it in class A or class B? And the challenge with all classifiers is that you have to weigh off between what's known as is, uh, uh, accurate like precision and recall. So you either can be really consistent, like always be able to find um, what's like we say, yes, this is bad, yes, this is good, and be really accurate about that. If you, in exchange, you're only gonna get a very small fraction, like the most obvious examples. You know, like you're gonna have a bunch of, of false negatives. Um, just for context, language is really hard to classify. Like if we took two sentences that really basically mean the same thing, and we pull the audience and say, do these two sentences mean the same thing? We are only gonna get 90% agreement. And that's about as basic as we get. And Google has run this study. Like this was a, a factoid that got passed on to me by a Googler. Um, and so we, we have this problem, which is once you get into more ambiguous things, like saying, is this hate speech? It gets really hard to say, like, is this hate speech or is this not? Or, or, or the example that is a huge problem is um, people who talk about hate speech, so for example, um, or like violence against women. Um, uh, I have met with women um, ad advocates against online violence against women all around the world who say the same thing to me, which is they say, my account got taken down, my entire team's accounts have gone taken down. Because the AI can't really distinguish between someone talking about violence against women online and violence against women online. Yeah. And until we have AIs that really can understand context and nuance and have like enough breadth and depth of being like, oh, like when this person from this minority group uses this language to another person who is part of the same group, it's okay. But if it's from someone in an out group or like a more privileged group who uses the same language, that's considered a slur. Like it's complicated. Um, and it's unlikely that the computers are gonna do it well anytime in the next 10 to 20 years. And yeah. 10 to 20 years. I'll yeah. add that they've been trying to do this for probably about 10 years now. They've, yeah. been, they've been saying we've got automated systems that can flag this stuff, and it hasn't improved dramatically since, I mean, now we're in a new sort of AI boom mm -hmm. where everybody's talking about AI this year, but they've had these automated systems that, and sort of, for images are kind of a famous one where they have, they have systems that'll scan the images, and if it thinks it sees, like, a nipple, it'll shut it down, and a lot of images that are not you know, sexual or otherwise gets swept up into that too. The, there, there was a, a movement called Free the Breast, which was all about breastfeeding. So like Facebook was taking down like a lot of imagery around women breastfeeding. Women, yeah. um, and you know, they, they had, you know, bre uh, breastfeeding sit-ins and that kind of thing, um, protesting them. So I actually have two questions, but, um, <laughs> well, the, the first question was really just, I wanted a, you to follow up on what changes Facebook made. But mm -hmm. my question is much more complex than that, and it really tilts with what you just said, which was, I wanted to ask you, I don't really understand Facebook or even Twitter and their whole concept of the marketplace, mm. that they're the, the, the God-given right to, to um, mm. censor things or be the open freedom. And what I don't understand is, we have 150 years of print journalism mm. that's evolved, Mm -hmm. And so I don't understand why we're trying so hard to try and make this a digital universe. And you're, you're saying that AI is not going to do it, which frightens me anyway, mm -hmm. the whole concept. But I want to know why we're not trying to move away from having places like Facebook and Twitter be this universe that mm -hmm. dictates what information is or should be or what we should listen to instead of having legitimate sources of mm -hmm. print journalism or things like it that are telling us things that are factual, and so we're not trying to avoid what is fact and what isn't. I think this is like the, the like French, fi French fries versus kale dilemma, right? Like, like French fries are delicious. I think kale is also delicious. It's just like a different level of complexity, right? And, and part of the challenge is that 
um, you know, uh, social media started out, or at least Facebook started out, as a place for our family and friends to stay in touch. So, like, a, this one of the things I taught, one of the reasons I wrote this book was I really wanted people to take context um, around how has the internet changed over the last 20 years. You know, we, we, the laws that currently govern the internet are from 1996, back when we only had bulletin boards, right? Which is like a 1980s technology. Um, when we first had feeds, like social media feeds, so that's 2008, uh, those feeds were basically like email inboxes. They were chronological. Um, you got to see updates of your friends and family. Over time, they became more and more of the space that people got socialization from. You know, uh, some of you may have read Bowling Alone. You know, it's a book about how in the United States, we used to have a lot of in-person social institutions, like people, many more people went to church much more regularly. People were members of bowling leagues and garden clubs and Rotary and Elks Lodges. You know, people had opportunities for in-person connection. Many, many people don't anymore. You know, they, socializing in person costs money. We have been uh, closing down our community spaces that aren't Starbucks's, you know? Um, and so it means that for many people, the place that they can go and get even a, a, a you know, a, a, a very lightweight version of socialization is online. And so um, one of the reasons why I am always like a little cautious to not be a social media absolutist, because there's definitely people who work in this space who say, sign off tomorrow. Like the only way you can save yourself is sign off. Is that there are, there are a lot of people who are either economically margin marginalized, um, maybe physically marginalized, they have mobility issues, um, or geographically marginalized. You know, they might be in a, a more rural place or, or just you know, a play, they don't have a car and it's hard to get around. Um, our, our reliance on Facebook is both a symptom and a cause mm -hmm. because it's also more convenient. And so people go and show up less in person and that makes it even harder to have these in-person options. So it's, it's complicated. I, I, I totally think we should spend a lot more money on, on investing in journalism and high quality sources of information but social media also plays this whole other function in people's lives. Um, I was uh, thinking along the Cambridge Analytica version of uh, Donald Trump's use in Facebook and uh, uh, that terrified me and, and The Great Hack was a good movie uh, showing it off. But um, I'm also seeing that Facebook is like smaller than WhatsApp or hmm. WeChat, and where do you go from here? <laughs> um, is that the political, uh, is that a, a whole field of political speculation? The social media uh, campaigning, whatever, hmm. lies, disinformation, hmm. fake news. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, the, one of the spaces that I'm a little worried about is, um, is TikTok. So, so the, the, the way you make safer social media is you make human scaled social media. So that means, you know, Facebook of 2010 had no algorithms. You know, you saw information because a human wanted you to see that information. They couldn't put you in a million person Facebook groups because you know, if, you had, if you had a million person Facebook group, your, your feed would get flooded because that group would make too much content every day. When you have an algorithm that sorts through the information for you, you no longer see a complete picture of, of the world. You, know, you see whatever the biases are in the algorithm. You know, that, that group might make a thousand pieces of content a day and you see 10 of them. If the algorithm is, 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 has sway in any direction, the, the 10 you see are going to be the most extreme version of that bias. Um, I, TikTok is 100%, like 100% that, that fulfillment. It, it is designed to be an experience that where you see information because the algorithm wanted you to see it, not necessarily because a human wanted you to see it. And, and we know that, you know, you know, so TikTok came out of China 
And in China, they have very, very strict laws on how information is regulated, right? So if you use the wrong words, if you have the wrong ideas, whatever the, the trend is of the day that is blacklisted, you can get serious, serious consequences. So TikTok is designed to make things go hyper viral, you know, make 80% of what everyone sees in the world be from a few thousand pieces of content a day because that allows them to go and manually check that content. And there have been scandals in the last few years of um, you know, TikTok, if you were visibly gay, if you're visibly disabled, uh, TikTok would not let you go viral uh, to protect you from being bullied, which is clearly not the reason why. Um, I, and so that's a system that is even more dangerous. Yeah, and you talk about being alone yeah. right here. It's a, it's a consumer sort of face. So it's, it's, you're not even really networking with friends mm -hmm. and family at all. You're being fed it's content. Just cons you're, consuming. It's just falling on your, and, your and, eyeballs. And it's, it's much more designed for being habit forming yeah. because you only get new things by actively soliciting it. So it's like if you don't, you, you can't be on, like you can, ha you can be scrolling Instagram and watch Netflix, right, or watch the news. Um, on, on TikTok, you know, it, the, the, the rewards, you know, the stimulus reward cycle is much tighter. It's like, I did an action, I got a tasty thing. You got I did your food reaction. pellet. Yeah. Or you, got, you got the food pellet. Yeah. Um, and uh, it means that, you know, uh, you look at the number of minutes kids spend on TikTok a day, it's, it's, it's like well over 100. Um, uh, you know, 30% of kids now say they're on screens until midnight or later most weeknights. Um, the average kid in the United States is a teenager in the United States is on social media for three and a half hours a day, right? And that's why the Surgeon General put out an advisory a month ago. And I want to be really clear for everyone in the room: there have been like less than fifteen advisories since the sixties. Yeah. You know, these are yeah. things like cigarettes cause cancer, yeah. uh, and, uh, can uh, obesity kills people, breast uh, seat belts save lives. Uh, breastfeeding helps babies. And one reason we know all this stuff, again, is your work as a whistleblower. So I do think we yeah. owe you a, 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 a debt of gratitude. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you for thank you. Yeah, helping to bring about that change. And so the, the, I think an optimistic note to kind of, uh, you know, maybe one of the things we, we end on or like we do a couple more questions, but I want you to carry with you is Historically, when there's an advisory, within a couple of years after an advisory, some kind of big motion comes forward. And, and I, I think um, we're, you know, every single social issue, we have a finite number of children we're willing to harm. So when it comes to cars, we put eight-year-olds in car seats. Like, let's, let's pause for a moment and, and think about the data. You know, the difference between having an eight-year-old in a car seat and like a six-year-old in a car seat it's not a ton of saved kids. It's like 60 kids a year, 100 kids a year, whole country. Think about how many fights with eight-year-olds over car seats happen every year because they don't want to sit in those car seats, right? How many dollars are spent on those car seats? How much time is spent getting the kid out of the car, seat, car seats? But it's, as a society, we say it's worth it to save that 60 kids or 100 kids. When it comes to things like guns, we're willing to tolerate thousands of kids dying. Right now, social media, we're creeping up on the number of hurt kids where we're not willing to tolerate it anymore. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out in the next couple of years. Yeah. So in all of this, where is Sheryl Sandberg? Oh, great, great question. Um, so Sheryl Sandberg was the COO of Facebook for a number of years. So she's really responsible for taking Facebook from being a, a company where you know, it was iffy, how is this going to be a business to being a company that is, you know, uh, has 35% profit margins and, you know, makes $150 billion a year. You know, very few companies have that much revenue and such high profit margins. And um, I think it's going to be, I, I don't know exactly what went down last year, because last year, Sheryl Sandberg left Facebook. Um, and she left Facebook under very odd circumstances. So in general, when um, executives leave who have been there for a long time, who have been very pivotal to um, the growth of the business, you usually have like glowing press releases being like, thank you for your contribution. Um, Cheryl left very suddenly, 
Facebook claimed that she left because, um, that she had been pushed out because she used company resources to plan her wedding. Who knows if that's how, what, what degree that was an actual issue. And the second one, and this is the one where I was like, oh, where there's smoke, there's fire, um, was she used company resources to promote her book. Not her first one, not Lean In, her second book. And for context, for anyone who doesn't read the, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, like, oeuvre, I, I, her second book was about um, her husband dying and how did she have resiliency. And it was basically an ad for Facebook groups. It was like, my husband died, the thing that got me through it was Facebook groups. And remember, this book came out, um, you know, post Cambridge Analytica. Uh, it was like, you know, basically the best press you could have for Facebook. The idea that Facebook, her using Facebook resources to promote this book was why they let her go mm -hmm. is just very suspicious to me. And I don't, I don't have any evidence of what, about, what I'm about to say next. I, th I think the government said, hey, all the documents end with you. So it's either gonna be your fault or it's gonna be Mark's fault. Um, and and I, like I said, I don't know if that's actually what happened, but when she left under such a odd yeah quickly kind yeah. of uh, feeling um yeah. i started wondering yeah. yep well i mean it could be a sign that you know that things are changing that, that spaces yeah. for change are opening up and again thanks to your work we've had we've seen mm -hmm. you know things build to the to the surgeon general's warning we've seen facebook try to sort of duck and run transform itself into a whole new company meta, meta. Uh, trying to sort of dodge this scandal. So obviously, mm -hmm. you know, this did, this left a real mark. And to your point uh, earlier, I think, you know, I th social media is more, more likely than not gonna <laughs> exist in some capacity. So it is imperative that we, you know, take lessons from what you've learned and what you've helped blow the whistle on, uh, you know, to, to build the future of more democratic, more transparent, more equitable and less harmful social media networks. So. Thanks again, and thanks everyone for coming out. Let's do one more round of applause for Francis. Thank you.